For many owls, life begins at sunset, when the houses and streets in our towns are lit by electricity and we are safe and warm indoors. Do you ever stop to think just how the birds of the night survive? It's never easy for them, yet where you and I would starve and freeze, birds like the barn owl find food and keep warm. To hunt in the dark, owls must have very sharp senses, and so they are very sensitive to danger too. Would you last out a long, bleak winter night out of doors? And would you find enough food or shelter if you had, at the best, only the pale moon to see by? Let's start with the barn owls, the ones that depend most on man. They prefer wooded farmland to live in and often use our buildings to nest in. Barn owls are strangely beautiful with their white pointed faces and soft sandy brown plumage and deadly talons to catch the mice, voles and rats that they feed on. Barn owls are truly the farmer's friends. Luckily for our camera, the barn owl often hunts before dark hovering on soft, silent wings like a great white moth. Watch how it scans the ground, feet dangling and claws at the ready. At dusk, you can see that he is using his eyes to hunt. But he is listening too, for after dark, he may have to locate his prey entirely by ear, by hearing the faintest rustle in the grass. To make this possible, most owls have special feathers on the front edge of the wing, to damp out any swishing sound and make the flight extra quiet. The roadside verge is often a good hunting ground, but dangerous. Owls too intent on the job may easily be hit by passing cars. It's always worth keeping an eye open for them on fence posts by the roadside. Barn owls like old buildings. This would be the sort of place they might nest in, but they're very hard to find by day, seldom showing themselves, perhaps because their pale colouring makes them rather obvious. With their big dark eyes, they shun the light normally and creep into a dark place to spend the daylight hours. And don't forget that barn owls are protected by special laws and must never be disturbed at their nest sites. The real woodland owl is the tawny owl, the commonest Scottish owl and another night hunter. In his daytime roost, he usually sits pressed against the trunk of the tree. But don't search for him, just listen. The blackbird's alarm call nearly always means there's an owl nearby. Tawny owls pay little attention to fussy blackbirds for all their noise. But if a wood mouse appears with the faintest rustle amongst the leaves, then his ears, sensitive to high-pitched sounds, will enable him to spot everything that's going on. Toy owls seldom fly or feed by day. But when they're nesting and the female is waiting with her chicks for food on the nest, like this one high up on the side of a larch tree, her mate may occasionally fly in with food in broad daylight to keep pace with the needs of his growing family. But any visit by an owl to the nest, in fact any movement at all, will raise a chorus of alarm calls from the blackbirds now busy feeding their own young on a diet of worms. After dropping his prey on the nest, the male owl will return to his day roost, leaving his mate to feed the young. At first, she picks up and holds in her beak the vole that he has brought, while the young peck at it. Then, she tucks it down into the nest. 
where it will probably be swallowed whole, even by these quite small chicks. If you're in a wood with old trees, listen. You may hear the hungry chicks from inside the nest hole before you spot the adult keeping guard nearby. As the young grow, they will climb up inside the nest hollow and sit at the nest entrance, which of course upsets the local blackbirds again. But long before it can fly, a young tawny owl may climb down the nest tree and up onto a daytime perch nearby. Now it may look lost, but please it doesn't need rescuing. Its parents know quite well where it is and are much better at feeding it than you will ever be. So please don't touch. But how do owls find enough food in the dark? Well, look first at those big black eyes, both looking forward with binocular vision just like ours. And see how they can swivel their whole head to almost any angle to focus the eyes. An owl's eyes are as big as yours, but in a much smaller skull, about the size of a pigeon's inside all that fluff. So its eyes take up most of its head, merely separated by a bony plate in between. Below that is its beak, quite small but very strong and sharply hooked for tearing its prey. The round discs of an owl's face appear to be all eyes, each with a whitish membrane hidden under the outer eyelid to clean the eye's surface. Now, if your eyes were as large in proportion to your head, they'd be as big as two oranges. But much more remarkable are its ears. That facial disc is really two crescents of ear coverts, feathers that protect its ear cavity, an opening about as big as our ear, in a head one-fifth the size. With an ear as big as that, no wonder owls can detect their prey and focus on it even in pitch darkness. So remember, an owl's round face is shaped by the ear coverts to hide those specially adapted but invisible ears inside its head. What then about the long-eared owl? Well, it's a trick, just tufts of feathers, to make a bird look like a fierce cat. The short-eared owl tries the same trick, but only when it's alarmed like this one on the nest, or this young one at the roadside. When the adult sits panting but relaxed on her nest on a hot summer's day, the feather tufts are almost invisible. And a fully grown juvenile short-eared owl is as round-headed as a tawny owl and has quite different eyes. The brilliant yellow eyes and the imitation ears only work as a trick to fool their enemies, of course, because these owls live and hunt mostly by day. If you travel on country roads, you can often see short-eared owls hunting in broad daylight over moorland or marsh or young forests. They nest on the ground, in thick heather or reeds, where mice and voles thrive in the cover. When food's plentiful, these owls may lay seven, eight or even more eggs. In a normal year, four to six. The chicks hatch out with the help of the little white egg tooth on the end of the bill to break out of the shell. This nest has three newly hatched chicks and two eggs, round and white. These owls have acres and acres of young forest to hunt over in the foothills of Ben Lomond. When the trees grow up, the owls will have to move to more open ground. Meanwhile, they are the forester's friends. They feed mostly on voles. These may be the bank voles, with their sandy brown coats and furry ears. But the smaller and darker short-tailed voles are their main food supply.
On this diet, the young thrive and grow. Even when still fluffy with down, they have the bright yellow eyes of their parents. But they don't seem to like bright sun, which makes their eyes quiver. Long-eared owls are shy birds of the night, nesting mostly in small woods and copses, often in pine trees. But they hunt for the same kind of prey with the same deadly weapons. As they are so much birds of woodland, one of Scotland's surprises is to find long-eared owls nesting in Shetland, where there are virtually no trees because of the strong winds. In the small town of Scalloway, beside the harbour where the fishing boats lie, is a garden with a sheltering stone wall, inside which grow a few stunted trees. Here you can walk up in broad daylight to the garden wall and see up to five or six long-eared owls perching quite openly in the branches. It's the most sheltered spot in Scanaway, but it's still quite breezy. Because there are so few trees, these owls nest on the ground, in the heather up on the hill in summer. But in winter, they've nowhere else to go except this garden. So they make a wonderful surprise for the visiting bird watcher. But Shetland's biggest surprise was on the island of Fetler, where in the 1970s a new sound was heard on the hill, the bark of snowy owls from the Arctic, which nested here for the first time ever recorded in Britain. They're quite fierce birds, the female even bigger than her mate and heavily barred with black and brown, so much greyer in appearance. But he makes more noise with a loud barking note especially if anyone goes anywhere near the nest. The call of the hen is much more squeaky. The snowy owls settled on Fetler partly because there was plenty of food, especially rabbits. Now all owls cast up pellets of the bones and fur of their victims that they can't digest. The snowy owl pellets we found on Fetler often contained quite large bones of rabbits or birds. Right from the start, these owls were guarded by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, and a hide was used so that visitors could come and watch them. Many did, though often in the grey mist of midsummer. Under these conditions, the nest, a hundred yards away, was hardly visible. But even through the drifting mist, a view of Scotland's rarest breeding birds was a thrill. Great care was taken not to disturb the birds. Word would come back over the phone that the male was perched on a rock down by the sea, and the female sitting quietly on the nest. So now was a good time for a changeover of watchers at the observation post. Usually the owls knew nothing of the human invasion of their nesting place. Sometimes, however, the male owl took off to fly down perhaps to a small pool where he occasionally went for a drink. And from there, he might spot the approaching party of bird watchers as they walked over the hill. Now, snowy owls can be quite aggressive near the nest. So some lucky visitors might occasionally get a really close view of the male owl flying past on a kind of warning flight. An aggressive tour of inspection, watched closely by his mate on the nest below. And if he landed, he would be dive-bombed by the Arctic skewers, which nested on the same hillside. Not everyone saw so much activity at the nest, though. But nearly everyone saw something of these owls from the hide until 1976. 
Then, after rearing many young over several years, the only breeding male disappeared. And so this wonderful sight of snowy owls feeding their young on a Shetland hillside came, for the time being at least, to an end. But there are plenty of commoner owls in Scotland. So why not go out at dusk and listen for those tell-tale blackbirds and see if you can spot a tawny owl waiting for his hunting time in the dark.